the Pope, and the President. Tonight, we have team coverage of their meeting at the Vatican. First, our report from Rome. Our Vatican bureau chief reveals what the two leaders talked about. Then, Global Summit. See President Joe Biden's key meetings with other world leaders. And Vatican Insider. A former ambassador to the Holy See joins us to put it all in perspective. You're watching special coverage on EWTN News Nightly for Friday, October 29th, 2021. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. I'm Tracy Sable. Pope Francis and President Joe Biden met at the Vatican today ahead of the summit of G20 leaders in Rome. This is his message for the World Day of Peace. Prior to their exchange of gifts, the Holy Father held an unusually lengthy meeting with the president. The papal audience lasted for more than an hour. Afterward, there were greetings, which included the First Lady and other top White House officials. Joining us now from Rome is Andreas Tonhauser, EWTN Vatican Bureau Chief. Andreas, great to see you. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about the meeting and the purpose of it. Thank you, Tracy, and good evening from Rome. This weekend is going to be a busy one here. 20 world leaders are meeting here in the Eternal City. And three of them are also visiting the Pope. The Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi, South Korean President Moon Jae-in, and today U.S. President Joe Biden. There's been massive media interest, also because it's Joe Biden's first papal meeting as a president. And secondly, there's the ongoing issue of abortion. At this point, we have no clear information if they've touched upon this topic during the meeting, which was not an official state visit, but a private encounter with His Holiness. The main topics that were discussed, according to a brief statement from the Holy See, were related to the G20 summit, the climate, how to fight poverty, and migration. Well, Andreas, as you just mentioned, uh, details are sort of few about the meeting between Pope Francis and President Biden, but what was the atmosphere like? It seems it was a warm and friendly atmosphere, and as I said, we, we do not exactly know what they were talking about. Uh, but from a Vatican statement, we know that there was a mutual commitment on the healthcare situation and the fight against COVID, as well as protecting freedom of religion and conscience. Interestingly enough, during the last few days and months, there were several signals also from the Holy See that Pope Francis was not going to change his clear stance on the protection of life. And as you mentioned this week, he blessed the so-called bells of the voiceless from Poland promoting the protection of life from conception to its natural end. And secondly, on the papal flight coming back from Slovakia in September, Pope Francis said in response to a journalist's question that abortion is more than an issue. Abortion, it's murder. And thirdly, earlier this month, the Vatican condemned a controversial anti-homophobia bill that was presented in the Italian Senate. So it's very clear that Pope Francis supports life, whereas President Biden has been publicly pro-abortion. And Andreas, before I let you go, you mentioned that the Holy Father received other visitors today. Uh, what more can you tell us about their visits? Well, seen from a global Christian perspective, the visit of India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi might be even more significant. He leads the world's largest democracy, which, according to international human rights organizations, is growing more and more hostile towards religious minorities. Also, Catholics suffer from an increasing anti-Christian sentiment. Modi's own Hindu nationalist BGP party is promoting a pure Hindu nation void of any other religions. And President Biden praised the Holy See's firm stance on religious freedom and human rights. Hopefully, that will also be a topic in tomorrow's encounter. Well, Andreas, thank you so much for that report this evening. Andreas Tonhauser, EWTN Vatican Bureau Chief. Thank you again. Thank you. President Joe Biden's spotlight on the world stage continued throughout the day as he met with other world leaders around gathering in Rome for this weekend's G20 summit. White House correspondent Owen Jensen continues our team coverage tonight. No, it didn't. It came up and just talked about the fact that he was happy I was a good Catholic and I should keep receiving communion.
President Joe Biden tells reporters about his extended meeting with Pope Francis. The president also met with the Vatican's top diplomat, Cardinal Pietro Perolin, serves as the Holy See Secretary of State. The two were joined by U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken and National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan, among others. The White House says they discussed the climate crisis, global support for vaccinating the developing world against COVID-19, and religious freedoms. According to the White House, President Biden thanked the Vatican for speaking out on behalf of the wrongfully detained, including in Venezuela and Cuba. From the Vatican, the president's lengthy motorcade took him to private meetings with other world leaders, among them Italy's president and prime minister, who are hosting the Group of 20 summit. The White House saying President Biden expressed gratitude for Italy's contributions to NATO and for providing temporary shelter to over 4,000 Afghans en route to being resettled in the United States in August. President Biden also met with French President Emmanuel Macron, together smiling with arms on each other. But reporters shouted questions about the relationship asking if it's repaired after the U.S. angered France over a secret U.S.-British submarine deal with Australia. The contract cut out France. Is America really back? And then inside, the two sitting side by side, President Biden calling France an extremely valuable partner, acknowledging the U.S. was clumsy in its handling of how the submarine deal went down. The French lost out on more than $60 billion from the submarine deal. President Biden did not formally apologize. Now at this weekend's G20 summit in Rome, the world's supply chain mess will be addressed. Then it's off to Scotland for a climate summit. President Biden returns to Washington next Wednesday. At the White House, Owen Jensen, EWTN News Nightly. Well, today, of course, was not the first time a U.S. president has met a pope. The tradition began in 1919 when Woodrow Wilson became the first U.S. president to meet with a pope. This occurred during a time where anti-Catholic sentiments were high in the United States. The next meeting between a pope and a president would not take place for almost 40 years. And in 1963, John F. Kennedy, the first Catholic president, met Pope Paul VI at the Vatican. And joining me now to discuss this is Jim Nicholson, former U.S. Ambassador to the Holy See and former Secretary of Veterans Affairs. Ambassador Nicholson, welcome back. So good to see you again. Um, we know that President Biden has met with Pope Francis before, but not while he was President of the United States. Um, how different do you think this meeting was now that Joe Biden is a world leader? And what type of issues are typically talked about? Uh, we don't really have a whole lot of details about this particular meeting. Well, any meeting with, uh, with the Holy Father and the President, I think, is significant. And uh, in recent years, not at all unusual. When I was uh, U.S. ambassador for four years at the Vatican, uh, President Bush visited uh, Pope John Paul II three times. Vice President Cheney came several times, Secretary of State Powell. But these are important visits, and it, it I think, speaks well of the perceived moral authority that the Pope has, the head of the Catholic Church, in communion with probably a billion, a billion, two people around the world, uh, truly uh, recognized uh, and respected world figure. And I think it was fortuitous in a way that the G20 happened when it did in Italy, which gave another good excuse for President Biden to be there and to be meeting with the Pope. Uh, note that uh, Vice President Harris uh, or I think, or, excuse me, but uh, Speaker Pelosi went over there just for a weekend visit, uh, and it's interesting. I mean, there are numbers are sagging at home. Uh, their administration is, is is flagging and flailing, and uh, so I think a you know a visit, a friendly, non-controversial visit with the Pope, is something that could always give a lift uh, to a president politically. And one wonders why they didn't have more uh, photography of the visit between the president and the pope, because we usually do have that. And I don't know the answer to that. You can uh, you can wonder about that, but I don't know if the Vatican is thinking it's being used a bit uh, by American politicians. Uh, I don't know. But, uh, but it was certainly legitimate for the president to visit the pope today because he was in Italy, and, and they always do when they go there.
Yeah. And as we know, as we mentioned, President Biden and Pope Francis also exchanged gifts during their meeting, which is customary. Can you talk about the significance of that, you know, and the type of gifts that are typically exchanged during these meetings? I can, but they're not very significant. Uh, although I remember vividly when uh, Vice President Cheney came to visit the Pope, gave him a beautiful uh, glass dove, you know, sort of symbolic of the Holy Spirit. And Pope John Paul II was taken with that. He held it in his hand. He kind of stroked it as he continued to visit uh, with the group there and then handed it off to, to Archbishop Harvey. Uh, but normally those are sort of perfunctory uh, exchanges. I think what's far more important is, is what they discussed. And one wonders whether they discussed uh, a very timely, important topic uh, to Catholics, Catholics in America, and that's the question of abortion. But we don't know. I don't know whether they discussed that uh, or not. It sounds like maybe they did not. Yeah, I, we really don't know for sure. That's a big question there. Uh, you mentioned, you know, sort of what comes out of some of these meetings. I, I want to talk about that a little bit more. Have there been any major humanitarian or world issues that have been worked on or maybe resolved as a result of presidents meeting with popes? Oh, indeed. Absolutely. Uh, we got very robust support from Pope John Paul II of, for putting a coalition together and going into Afghanistan because he felt we, uh, America, was attacked and it was morally justified uh, to go in and defend ourselves and, uh, you know, ferret out the perpetrators. Uh, later, uh, two years later, in 2003, uh, President Bush felt compelled that we needed to go into Iraq. And uh, so we had some very high-level diplomatic <laughs> discussions between the Pope and the President, and between myself and, and the Secretary, his Papal Secretary of State, and, and uh, the Pope was adamant against that. Uh, but that, that really didn't uh, fracture our relationship. Uh, the President respected that the Pope is a man of peace, uh, and the Pope respected that the President uh, was responsible for the, the common good, and it was his prudential judgment that was on the line about whether we should go to war in Iraq. And and uh, and that actually, that's covered in the catechism of the church under the just war theory of, uh, of, a, of a leader being responsible for his people. And so the Pope never said it was immoral for us to go into Iraq, but he's very clear and vociferous in his opposition to it. Well, Ambassador, thank you so much for your time today and for your insights. We really appreciate it. Thank you again, and God bless you. Thank you. Coming up, Capitol Hill stalemate. Progressive Democrats stall President Joe Biden's economic agenda. And vaccine mandate. It's not just government and businesses. How one diocese is getting involved. The night before President Joe Biden met the Holy Father, a U.S. Cardinal said Catholic bishops have, quote, a sacred duty to apply canon law to pro-abortion politicians when it comes to giving Holy Communion. In a statement, Cardinal Raymond Burke writes pro-abortion lawmakers, quote, have in fact contributed in a significant way to the consolidation of a culture of death in the United States. The 73-year-old calls it a matter of life and death for the unborn. All Democrats have left Capitol Hill empty-handed. Progressives refuse to back a bipartisan infrastructure bill for roads and bridges. They say they need to see more than just the framework of the president's economic plan. Progressives say the sides are drawing closer to a deal. The fight between moderates and progressives is do we spend 1 percent of our GDP or 2 percent of our GDP? But ultimately, the role of government to do good is what's at stake, and it's going to be historic when, when we deliver. But Republicans say Democrats have lost sight of the needs of middle-class Americans. I continue to hear the question asked, have you ever seen an administration in Congress as incompetent as this? 
trillions of dollars in spending, major expansions of government agencies, and even more inflation that will lead to higher costs for all Americans. Democrats continue to write the final text of the bill and hope to have it on the House floor next week. The Biden administration says that it will not stop firing civilian and active duty military members who are seeking exemptions to coronavirus vaccine mandates. Yesterday, a district court judge in the nation's capital asked the White House to halt the firings while the cases proceed through the courts. The Diocese of Grand Falls in Canada has instated a vaccine mandate for parishioners. The mandate was put in place for those 12 and older. Churchgoers will have to provide proof of vaccination by downloading a vaccine passport app on their phones or having a physical copy of the QR code. Joining me now is Christine Roussel, D.C. correspondent for the Catholic News Agency. Christine, great to see you. Thanks for coming on. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, absolutely. Our pleasure. So what more can you tell us uh, about the why the diocese in Canada decided to implement this vaccine mandate? Well, it wasn't entirely up to the diocese because the province of Newfoundland and Labrador is requiring that those people who want to attend what they're calling a non-essential business uh, or place show proof of vaccination if they are over the age of 12. So under the uh, province's policy, that includes places like yoga studios, hockey games, and houses of worship. So let me back this up a little bit. Um, Were they able to open up, fully open up at any point, um, or were they keeping restrictions in place while they were implementing this new law? Uh, Restrictions are still in place, even with the vaccine passport uh, throughout Newfoundland and Labrador, which is the province of the, uh, where the Diocese of Great Falls is located. People who attend mass still have to wear masks. Um, the Diocese of Grand Falls it still has a prohibition on congregational singing, uh, 50% capacity. It's kind of almost like how this area was last year, and it's still the restrictions are still very heavily in place, even with the vaccine mandate. They, masks are still required. So things really never really got back to normal at all? Not really, no, at least not on an official level. What happens to those who are either unwilling or maybe can't get vaccinated. Maybe they have um, some health restrictions uh, that require them not to be vaccinated. So the Diocese of Grand Falls didn't really make that clear in their letter to the diocese describing what will be happening with the implementation of the vaccine passport. But the bishop did say that those who are unvaccinated but wish to attend something like a wedding or a funeral, something that's kind of out of the ordinary and extraordinary event, would be permitted to, but with additional restrictions, which would include masking and spacing out and 50 percent capacity. The bishop said that those restrictions are expected to be lifted in due course, but have not given any sort of timeline on when that would be happening yet. What about alternative forms of worship? Uh, Will they do streaming masses online? I think that's kind of up to each parish, but streaming mass and actually watching it on your laptop or your TV doesn't count as going. And I know me personally, after about three weeks of Zoom mass, I was all set with Zoom mass and I just wanted to get back to the parish so I can be more kind of surrounded by everything and in the parish community, which was a really big part of my life. Uh, What else more can you tell us about the story that you think is really important for our viewers to know? So... This does raise interesting canon law questions because there are several canons that say that those who are baptized and in good standing can be barred from going to Mass, like if it's a public celebration, which is what Sunday Mass is. And it does kind of raise questions of when will these things go really back to normal. Newfoundland has, by all accounts, had an exceptional uh, COVID response. They've only had 16 total deaths since the start of the pandemic in the province and fewer than 2,000 cases. Those are enviable numbers for anywhere in the world, and you'd expect things to have been relatively back to normal, but it seems that they're dragging at that. And I, my heart goes out to Catholics there who, for any kind of reason, haven't gotten vaccinated yet and who just want to go to Mass. Well, Christine, thank you so much for coming on and talking with us. We appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. Well, the new director of the American Institute in Taiwan affirms U.S. commitment to the self-ruled island as Beijing presses its sovereignty claims. We are committed to helping Taiwan maintain its ability to defend itself. Sandra Onkirk says that U.S. will support Taiwan internationally, but did not specify details. Meanwhile, China's foreign minister warns against any unilateral actions between the U.S. 
and Taiwan. Lawmakers in Poland say they will continue to work on legislation to stop parades and other public gatherings promoting same-sex relationships. The proposal is being sent to the country's Interior Affairs Commission. It is unclear when the full parliament will consider the measure again. Up next, The Exorcist, how the best-selling book inspired a renewed connection for Catholics. And Ancient Mosaic, where tourists in the Holy Land can see a renovated look at history. Fifty years ago, The Exorcist was published. The best-selling book became an award-winning movie and also inspired many people to turn back to their Catholic faith. Correspondent Mark Irons reports on the real-life work of exorcisms in the church today. These stairs are called the Exorcist Steps on the campus of Georgetown University, made famous after appearing in The Exorcist, an award-winning 1973 film. When it came out, many flocked to the box office, but others recall staying away. I was afraid to watch it. Why are you afraid to watch it? It was scary. The movie inspired by events reported by more than 10 witnesses. On August 20th, 1949, a Washington Post article caught readers' attention. Boy has been freed by a Catholic priest of possession by the devil, Catholic sources reported yesterday. William Blatty, a Catholic student at Georgetown University at the time, heard about it. Years later, he would write The Exorcist, a novel inspired by the reports that was then adapted for the big screen. Bill's hope that The Exorcist might enkindle people's faith was abundantly fulfilled. Blatty died in 2017, but his wife Julie says over the years he received letters from those impacted by his work. Scores of people wrote to, to him to tell him of their first visit to the confessional in years after seeing the movie or reading the book. At the Catholic Information Center in Washington this week, Julie Blatty was joined by others to commemorate 50 years since her husband's novel was released and the details of the reports that inspired it. All the things that happened were very typical. This is not an unusual case. Monsignor Stephen Rossetti and Monsignor Charles Pope, appointed as exorcist in the Archdiocese of Washington, reflect on the real-life work of casting out demons. The, the demon takes possession of a person's body and they, they, they manifest, they speak and act through the body of that person. During an exorcism, special prayers are used by a designated priest. The Catechism of the Catholic Church states, exorcism is directed at the expulsion of demons or to the liberation from demonic possession through the spiritual authority which Jesus entrusted to his church. Nobody drives out a demon but Jesus, and the, if the priest does it, it's only the power of the Lord. Monsignor Pope says about 90% of the cases he encounters can be explained by mental health or psychological related reasons. And for those actually possessed, he says they most likely invited evil in, using things like voodoo, witchcraft, Ouija boards, or tarot cards. Monsignor Rossetti reminds all to stay close to the sacraments and prayer, and says we should not be afraid because Christ has overcome evil. So if you haven't been in a while, go to confession, you know, uh, you know, practice the faith, live a good life, and trust in Jesus. So. In Washington, Mark Irons, EWTN News Nightly. And finally tonight, a newly renovated ancient mosaic is now open for tourists to see near the ancient city of Jericho. The stone mosaic is part of Hisham's palace. It contains intricate, multicolored geometric patterns and dates to the reign of a Muslim Arab ruler in early 700s. Located below sea level in the West Bank, Jericho was featured in last Sunday's Gospel where Jesus heals blind Bartimaeus. And we thank you for watching tonight. For the entire EWTN News Nightly team, I'm Tracy Sable. Good night and God bless.